all right assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome back to another video so uh welcome to the series called science entry where we will be solving pure science questions every wednesday and uh, for today's class we will be covering eight questions from the biology section we will start off with relatively easier questions and then move on to more difficult questions now um right uh, so for this wednesday our topic is biology this will be followed by physics and then by chemistry so let's first talk about the first questions you see on your screen now ideally you would want to pause the um the video uh, every time we are about to start a new question think about the answer and then just hit play so the first question states that which of the following organelles is responsible for cellular respiration now we know that as far as the nucleus is concerned that is simply what we call as the control center of a cell this is where dna replication happens where rna transcription happens and mrna editing happens right so this in itself is not responsible for cellular respiration on the other hand we very famously hear that the mitochondria is basically the powerhouse of the cell this is basically where atp synthesis uh basically occurs right um so as you might be thinking when we talk about cellular respiration we basically talk about um atp generation slash synthesis so uh we will be leaning towards option number b but let's explore option number c and d before concluding our answer so we know that the golgi apparatus is where protein sorting packaging processing and basically modifications happen and as far as the endoplasmic reticulum is concerned the rough endoplasmic reticulum is where protein synthesis and folding happens and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is where lipid synthesis happens so these are basically concepts which are related to your very basic and first chapter that you study in a level slash fsc which is basically the cell and i'm 110 percent sure that you are sure about those concepts and you got this answer correct so yes the answer right here is mitochondria let's move on to the next question which is basically uh in which phase of mitosis do the sister chromatids separate and move towards opposite poles of the cell now i hope that you remember uh what happens in mitosis to put it very simply you have your cell the first thing happens is known as the prophase and prophase is where basically our chromosomes uh basically become visible and uh, they become visible and the centrioles they start moving towards the opposite poles so this is your prophase right then in our metaphase uh these chromosomes they start lining up at the equator at the very center of uh, basically the cell and um, we know that we have these uh we basically have these spindles side again spindles um and these will pull those chromosomes apart um the so the spindle fiber is going to like connect to the centromere of each of these chromosomes and then pull them apart right and then this is metaphase and then we know that in anaphase uh eventually these chromosomes they get pulled apart right my bad so these chromosomes they will get pulled apart like this and then they basically move towards the opposite poles that is anaphase and then finally you have telophase and this is where the chromosomes they decondense and the nuclear envelope basically reform so in the telophase um you have your chromosomes at these each poles they are now going to be uh, going to decondense right and there's going to be a nuclear envelope which will reform so this is telophase so if you remember each of these phases and then you, uh, i hope you know that uh, there is um, after telophase we basically have cytokinesis where the cytoplasm separates and the two identical daughter cells form um and i hope you also have an idea about interphase where dna replication happens and where the cell basically prepares for the next division now if you are aware of these concepts and i'm 110% sure that you are then it would be very easy for you to know that it is in fact in the anaphase stage where the sister chromatids they separate and they move towards the opposite poles so the answer for this is 2 or i should actually say c 
now let's come to uh basically question number three very straightforward question it says that what is the function of the enzyme amylase now i hope you have an idea about your hydrolytic enzymes so let's read option number a which says that it breaks down proteins into amino acids i hope you know that this is something which proteases do right so this is something which proteases do uh like your trypsin um and then we have our uh, breaks down lipids into fatty acids and glycerol and that's something what lipases do and then it breaks down starch into maltose so ring ring that is what amylase does so amylase actually breaks down your polysaccharide starch into maltose which is your disaccharide made up of two glucose molecules MLD says that it breaks down nucleic acids into nucleotides, but that's the job of nucleases. And there you go. Your answer then is C. All right, now let's move to question number four, which basically states um, that which of the following is an example of an uh, ectothermic animal? Now, you need to know, obviously, what ectothermic means in order for you to solve this question. So I hope that you know that we have uh, what we call as ectothermic animals, right? And we have our uh, endothermic animals. And I hope you know that ectothermic animals is just a fancy name for what we call as cold-blooded. And endothermic animals are those which are basically warm-blooded. So what's the difference? Well, cold-blooded animals, well, they cannot, what, what basically happens is that their temperature, their inside temperature or their body temperature, it varies with the environment. So they cannot control their own temperature. That's what basically it means. So if it's cold outside, they will also go cold. If it's warm outside, their temperature will also be warm. But warm-blooded animals try to maintain a relatively constant temperature. So, for example, human beings, uh, they uh, maintain or try to maintain the temperature at around 97 uh, degree Fahrenheit. Uh, sorry, 98 degree Fahrenheit. Or if it's 99 or 100, ho jata hai, so that basically happens in fever, obviously. But our body, even if we are in a cold environment or a hot environment, tries to maintain that temperature at 98 degrees Fahrenheit. All right. Um, and uh, so if you want to know uh, the examples of each of these, well, then ectothermic, mein, you basically have most of your reptiles. All right. And you have your amphibians. And you have your fish. And you have your invertebrates. As far as warm blooded, uh, blooded is concerned, uh, well, you have your mammals here your birds and a few other animals so to keep it simple this is what you need to know about ectothermic and endothermic and from there i hope you can uh, figure out that because we're talking about ectothermic animals that is going to be your fish all right or perhaps i should just stick with uh putting a red tick but yeah that's fish let's move to question number five it says that well what's the uh, what's the primary function of uh the nephron in the kidney well the nephron is something which looks like this i'll try to make a rough sketch obviously it's not going to be very accurate but i hope it gets the job done um so we have something like this i hope you are aware of what i'm drawing here right so this is something what a nephron looks like and nephrons are basically those functional units of the kidney so if you zoom into a kidney you will find millions of nephrons and these nephrons well their job is to basically filter blood and by filtering blood um, they basically make this concentrate which we call as urine and pass through our urethra and so when we talk about well what's the primary function of the nephron in the kidney while uh, production of urine is also the right answer but the main job here is the filtration of blood because it is during that filtration of blood that urine is basically eventually produced um so you can perhaps say that a and b are kind of both correct but yeah the nephron 
is responsible for the filtration of blood and the production of urine by removing waste products and regulating electrolyte balance. So I would say there are two correct answers over here. All right. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I, I kind of perhaps would have made a mistake while making this question, but the nephron is responsible for both of these things. All right. Uh, let's move to question number six, which says that which of the following is responsible for the transportation of water and nutrients in vascular plants? So I'm assuming that you're very much familiar with what I'm about to draw here, right? Uh, and that is basically what? That is uh, this fancy drawing that I used to make all the time um, during my A-levels. As well as O-levels, I remember there was a MCQ that used to show up. So uh, basically, uh, we know that we have something called as the vascular bundle. And then we used to have the xylem. And then we used to have the uh, phloem. And I hope you remember that it was the xylem which was responsible for the transportation of water and nutrients, whereas the phloem was re basically responsible for the transport of uh, the sugars. So the sugars and other uh, organic compounds, they used to move by through the phloem and uh, the xylem was responsible for the root the rest of the plant the water and minerals to transport. Kare. And so that's why the answer for this is xylem. Stromata is, are, are, are obviously involved in um, gas exchange. These we know are pores which are found in the epidermis of the leaves, stems and other organs that are controlling the gas exchange between the internal air spaces of the leaf and the atmosphere. So we do fancy things, right? Uh, that. Um, now chloroplasts are obviously organelles of the plants and they're responsible for photosynthesis. So I'm going to leave it as is. Let's move on to the next question, which is what type of symbiotic relationship is seen between a uh, between bees and flowers. Now, first, let's see the options. It says A is mutualism, communalism, parasitism and competition. But in order for me to answer these questions, we first need to be aware of what each of these means. So let's say we have two organisms involved in each of these conditions, all right? Now in mutualism, what basically happens is that both the organisms are interacting in such a way that both of them are benefiting. Okay, so the both are benefiting. Um, so I'll give you an example. So in our gut, we have a lot of microbes. Now those microbes are getting all the food and nutrition that they need from our gut. So they are getting benefited, but they're also benefiting us. And that is because uh, they in return produce, for example, vitamin K. And they in return uh, act as a normal flora and give competition to other pathogenic microbes, which may enter into the gut. All right. Then we talk about communalism. Now, communalism is basically an interaction where one species is benefiting and the other one is neither benefiting nor they are being harmed. So they're basically kind of in a neutral position. So you can say that one of them benefits, all right, and one is just in a neutral uh, condition. All right. Um, and then if we come towards parasitism, well, parasitism basically means uh, that one of the species is benefiting, but this is only happening at the cost of the other one. So one is being harmed. And competition is merely when both of the species, they are competing against one another, obviously. All right. Um, so, just like in your hair, which is leaked in Urdu, if I talk in Urdu, so um, that is parasitism because uh, uh, they suck blood from your scalp, all right? And uh, they don't give you much benefit in return. So that's uh, what a leech basically does um, um, to you, if you can, if you want to think about it. Um, all right. So after that, let's move on to the next question. Um, and that is uh, what we call as, um, sorry, the next question is, well, what is the process by which a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly called? So, um, well, you what, what you should think about in this way is the fact that um, 
you know this is something which has been i guess used in a lot of uh, songs as well in this process when the the caterpillar it transforms into a butterfly when any transformation like this happens is known as metamorphosis right this is metamorphosis photosynthesis obviously when uh, chemical energy is converted uh, sorry uh, light energy is converted into chemical energy and stored in the plant transpiration is when uh, water is pulled up and fermentation is for example when you produce alcohol um when when um, yeah when when we put uh, our yeast in anaerobic conditions that's when fermentation happens so uh, if if you are aware of these basic concepts again uh, at the end of this video you you would actually feel that these were very very basic concepts and the reason why is that i want to keep lesson number 1 very simple um so that uh, you guys don't get overwhelmed uh, all right um but yeah that's that and um uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, then give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon. And I will see you next time with uh basically another video. Um, and if you want to uh you know keep receiving one question per day, then you can subscribe uh or basically follow our Instagram account properly with Maria, where I post um basically one question every single day from each discipline uh to keep your momentum going. And if you want, then the math. uh sorry the reasoning course 2024 uh applications are now open you can go ahead and uh register yourself there i will leave the link in the description box so till the next time khuda hafiz